The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. Okay, let's go. After a couple failed United Nations Security Council resolutions, there was one passed in the General Assembly yesterday. It passed with a vote of 120 to 14 with 45 abstentions. It's a pretty good number. Uh, in the document, it called for an immediate, durable, and sustained humanitarian truce between Israeli forces and Hamas militants in Gaza. It also demanded continuous, sufficient, and unhindered provision of life-saving supplies and services for civilians trapped inside the enclave. It also called for the immediate, unconditional response response of all hostages inside of Gaza. Now, a couple notable no votes, and I'll put the uh, voting up here on the screen because there's a lot to pick through. Right? I'm not going to name every country and how they voted, but a couple notable ones here. Uh, votes against Israel and the United States. Uh, votes in favor, a couple notable ones here, uh, France and Russia. And then looking at some of the abstentions, uh, Australia did not vote, neither did Canada, Germany, India, Italy, Japan, Korea, the United Kingdom, or Ukraine. Now, a little background when it comes to these United Nations resolutions. Bottom line, they don't have any muscle. So these resolutions don't really mean anything. Uh, we've seen that play out in Ukraine a couple times now. So really, if anything, these votes are, are just more a way of kind of understanding how the international winds are blowing. You know, see how people feel about a certain issue. I hope everybody had a great weekend. Happy Monday to you. Oh my gosh, I probably watched 50 clips to try and find a good explanation of this United Nations ceasefire vote. And that's a guy named Preston Stewart who provided to me what was the clearest explanation of that. And I wanted to start off today basically there talking about kind of what happened over the weekend and really to me the just the incredible disconnect and we've got to start this is this is this is getting to where we're moving from how the heck do I want to say this? We're moving from like kind of explaining what's going on to really now shaking, at least for me, shaking my head at some of the things that are going on. And really this ceasefire is the best example of it because right now, you know, again, according to, according to what is being posted, the death toll on the Israeli side is 14, 1500, which is awful. The death toll on the Palestinian side is approaching 7,000. So, you know, I talked about this in the previous episode and at the end of the day, it's like, let's get involved and have a ceasefire. You know, this needs to get discussed politically. God, I can't even believe I'm saying that, but I am. This needs to get discussed politically, but it seems like, and again, this is on the Israeli slash American side, you know, they don't want to have a ceasefire. I don't know about the Hamas Palestinian, well, the Palestinian people, I'm sure want to have a ceasefire. I don't know about the Hamas or the people in charge of that faction what they want, because you really don't see any interviews from there. But, you know, this UN General Assembly, and by the way, the last episode, we also played the clips from the Secretary General of the United Nations, which obviously he came out and said a certain things that wasn't received very well on the Israeli side. So there's been a lot of back and forth on that. There's some other clips I'm going to play you from Queen Rania from Jordan, and then the Israeli response to that. But, you know, at the end of the day, the UN General Assembly voted on this humanitarian truce. You had out of 193 members, 120 of the countries voted to have a ceasefire. 14 countries voted to not have a ceasefire. And then 45 abstentions. And, you know, God, I don't, I don't know what's worse. The 45 countries that abstained or the 14 countries that said no ceasefire. I mean, neither one of those makes sense to me. You know, does that make sense to you? Honestly, like I, 
I'd love for somebody to explain why we should not have a ceasefire right now, why we should not pump the brakes on this, and let's see if we can get some resolution. I did want to touch on just some notable countries. You know, I'll be honest, I was surprised that France voted different than the United States. So France voted for ceasefire, United States did not. Iran voted for a ceasefire. So, you know, that's a little bit interesting. You would think they'd be like hells to the nose, but they voted for a ceasefire. And then the countries that voted against the 14 countries, Austria, Croatia, Czechia. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I did not realize the Czech Republic now calls themselves Czechia. I might not even be pronouncing that correctly, so I apologize to all my Czech fans, which I know is substantial. But, hmm, I didn't know that. So Czechia, C-Z-E-C-H-I-A. I guess that was what the Czech Republic goes by now. Fiji, Guatemala, Hungary, Israel, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nehru, Papua New Guinea, Paraguay, Tonga, and the United States. So those 14 countries were the, the against ceasefire, and then the notables on the abstained. And again, 45 countries abstained. Like, that's a little lame to me. The only country I would expect to subs- sus- abstain, and I'll check and see if they did, is Switzerland, because they abstained from everything. They're just like, you know what? We can't be bothered. We have a nice country, a nice life. Nice watches, nice cars. We're good. You guys, you guys fight, fight amongst yourselves. But as far as the countries that abstained, and you know, that's, that's lame to me. There's some big ones, actually. Australia abstained. Let's see. Denmark, Finland, Germany abstained. Greece, Iceland, India, Iraq, Italy, Japan Who else? Let's scroll down this list. Poland, South Korea, uh, the United Kingdom, they abstained. I'm actually surprised they abstained and did not vote no based on that, that clip I played you from their prime minister, Rishi Sunak, in the last episode. I'm actually very surprised the UK abstained. Anyway, the ceasefire thing definitely to me is, you know, that's, that's worth discussing. And one thing that I noticed over the weekend was, you know, in addition to the 120 countries, all of these, all of these organizations, which again, I think I touched on this in the last episode, you know, Doctors Without Borders, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, you know, every single humanitarian organization, which honestly, I'm really proud of this fact. That makes sense to me. These guys all weekend on their various social platforms, you know, they're screaming from the top of their lungs to have a ceasefire. And again, all these calls for a ceasefire are because civilians are just getting killed like left and right. And this is to prevent the ground incursion, which it's not going to. I mean, it, Israel over the weekend definitely seems like they are they are putting their ground attack in place. There actually was some activity, which I kind of called this last episode. There's there's some movement of tanks headed toward the West Bank, which is a totally different area than Gaza. We'll talk about that as as well, maybe not today, but tomorrow or something. But basically, they're going to move in. I mean, they're going to move in. There's not going to be a ceasefire. They're absolutely going to, you know, move their tanks in and, and start a ground incursion. And so what's happening right now is that based on, again, if you go to these not only, actually, you know what's interesting? Not only Sean King's page, which I've mentioned Sean a few times, but man, CNN, MSNBC, all these guys, they're showing incredibly, incredibly graphic videos, a, a lot more graphic than I expected coming from those outlets, but they're showing the damage and destruction to Gaza. I mean, it is, it is incredibly sad. And it's the civilians that are, that are the ones 
being killed and being being hurt. I mean, I literally don't think I've seen one story where it says like senior leader of Hamas, you know, taken out or or general of blah blah whatever, you know, killed. You know, it's I actually haven't heard anything about any Hamas person, whatever that is, being killed. It's it's really all innocent civilians. Actually, you know what? All right, let me play you this. So this is Jake Tapper on CNN. CNN's Jamana Karaje reports now from southern Lebanon. And a warning, some may find her report disturbing. This is a war on Hamas, Israel says. But it is the people of Gaza who are paying the heaviest price. No place safe, no place spared Israel's wrath. Danger looms around every corner of this besieged land. Every day, every minute spent in fear of when death may strike. Many now write their children's names on their legs, so if they're killed, their little ones are not just a number. Israel says it doesn't target civilians. It's Hamas, they say, that's using them as human shields. They try to avoid civilian casualties, they say, but the numbers and pictures tell a different story in a place where it is the innocent who are the majority. Hospitals, schools, mosques have been bombed. Gazans absorbing another horror, one that hit their tiny Christian community. An airstrike on a building at the compound of the San Porfirius Orthodox Church, one of the oldest churches in the world, where hundreds had sought refuge from the relentless bombardment. But this was no sanctuary. A scene of chaos at this house of worship. With no power, they used their phones to light up the rubble and dig bodies and survivors out of the carnage. Daylight brought the painful scenes of those searching through shrouded bodies for their loved ones, the inconsolable grief of those who found them, the gut-wrenching grief of a father mourning his children and a grandmother, her little George. With no prior warning, they bombed civilians in the church. They killed my three children. They killed my cousins. My whole cousin's family was wiped. The Israeli military said the airstrike was targeting a Hamas command and control center nearby. They said this was not the intention, what they call collateral damage. 17 Christians, entire families, including infants, perished in this strike. 26-year-old Viola was killed along with her husband and baby girl. Her sister Yara, her husband and children also gone. So much grief, so much anger at the silence over their suffering. And those who won't stop the bloodshed, there's seemingly nowhere left to run. All right, so let me play for you the clip from John Kirby. John Kirby's the National Security Council spokesperson. He's really the one you see along with uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre. You, you see him in most of the, the press uh, briefings and all that. I think that dude's gotten too much Botox in his face, though. If you look at his face, his cheekbones and his mouth, it kind of looks like the Joker. It's just always, uh, it doesn't move very much when he talks. Anyway, so here, here, here was his take when reporters really were pressing him for ceasefire. I actually give these reporters a lot of credit. They're starting to finally ask real questions. Give this a listen. Uh, if what you're saying to avert a ground incursion, that is a question for the Israeli Defense Forces. They get to make the decisions about what operations they're going to conduct or not. Uh, we don't believe that uh, a ceasefire right now um, is, is uh, what we would believe that a ceasefire right now is only going to benefit us. So he said, you know, that's up to the Israelis. So he deflected that. And then he said, uh, we don't believe a ceasefire is beneficial. Obviously that makes sense because they voted no in the UN voting and then basically says a ceasefire only benefits Hamas. They did press him on, well, why? How does it, what do you mean? How does that only benefit Hamas? And he did not give an answer and ended, ended the uh, interview and walked out. So that's goofy. Okay. Let's listen to Queen Rania from Jordan. If you don't know who Queen Rania is, she is a... H-O-T 
Queen of Jordan. She's been universally loved, I would say, over the years. I mean, everybody always seems to speak incredibly highly of her. And so here's the interview she did a few days ago with Christiane Amanpour. I think you guys might know who that is. She's a pretty famous CNN journalist. So here's Queen Rania of Jordan with Christiane Amanpour. When the president of the United States is told that he has seen evidence of children beheaded only to retract because the IDF said that there's no proof of that, that is confirmation bias. Even at your network, Christian, you know, the CNN website at the beginning of the conflict reported a headline, Israeli children found butchered in an Israeli kibbutz. And when you read through the story, it hasn't been independently verified. Now, my question to you, would you publish such a damning yet unverified claim made by a Palestinian? Why is the narrative always skewed to the Israeli side? The Western media and policymakers are quick to adopt the Israeli narrative. When Israel attacks, Palestinians die. But when Israelis die, they are murdered in cold blood. It's a massacre. Even like on October 7th, we've seen the situation described as savagery, barbaric, bloodthirsty. But we're not seeing that terminology describing the situation today, even though the atrocities are of greater magnitude. Israel commits these atrocities. It comes under the banner of self-defense. But when there's a violence by Palestinians, it is immediately called terrorism. Is the word terrorist just reserved exclusively for Muslims and Arabs? These are not two equal people in the conflict. One is an occupier and one is the occupied. One has a military, one of the mightiest in the world, and the other doesn't have military at all. Do our lives matter less? Why is it that when people are coming to represent the Palestinian issue, at the top of an interview, they have to have their humanity cross-examined? They have to present their moral credentials. You know, do you condemn? And we don't see Israeli officials being asked to condemn. I have never seen a Western official say the sentence, Palestinians have the right to defend themselves. Freedom of speech is apparently universal value, except when you mention Palestine. When people gather in support of Israel, they're exercising their right to assembly. But when they gather for Palestine, they are deemed terrorist sympathizers or anti-Semitic. All right. So that was Queen Rania from Jordan. You know, I think I've mentioned this before, but the guy that to me is doing the best coverage of this is Pierce Morgan. And it's on his show called Uncensored. I think the last time I mentioned him, I didn't mention the show name, but it's Pierce Morgan Uncensored. I watch it on YouTube. For some reason, his podcast doesn't play for me on Apple Podcasts. Maybe he's got an exclusive deal somewhere, so you can only play it through certain a certain player, kind of like Joe Rogan does with Spotify. But anyway, Pierce Morgan has done a really good job of bringing voices from both sides. And so next, I want to play for you I guess the response from, I've played this guy before, and actually I'm going to play a few different clips from him. His name is Naftali Bennett. He is the former prime minister of Israel. So this is the guy that was the prime minister before Netanyahu. And then I asked a friend of mine, I said, hey, what about this Naftali guy? What are your thoughts on this? And my friend is Jewish. And he's like, dude, that guy is more farther right than Netanyahu is. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's not good because, dude, I don't know if you know anybody over there, but you need to call him and this guy, I don't know. I'm going to let you listen for yourself and obviously make your own decisions because I am going to play you a few different things from him. But to me, he is just not a good representative voice for Israel. So give this a listen to his interview with Pierce. Queen Rania of Jordan uh, was very vocal this week, gave a very impassioned interview in which she accused Israel of being an apartheid regime, uh, said that there's always a distinction in the West between Israel's right to self-defense against any right of Palestinians to self-defense, which is always categorized as terrorism. She said that whilst what happened October the 7th was savagely barbaric, why is that terminology never used about what Israel does to Palestinians. What was your reaction to Queen Rania and that interview? Well, she totally lied and uh, said the simply wrong and uh, reprehensible things. Let's let's undo the unpack this. 
She talks about apartheid. Let's talk about apartheid. There's about a million and a half Israeli Arabs. They vote in the elections. They have one ballot like I do. There's uh, uh, over a dozen Arab members of Knesset. Uh, we have Arab Supreme Court judges. So we, we have Arabs even serving uh, some of them in the military. They enjoy full equal rights in Israel. So saying that Israel is an apartheid state simply has nothing to do with the facts. If she wants to bring some facts to substantiate her, her lies, I challenge her. Bring me facts that show that Israel is apartheid. A. B. Regarding the uh, barbarism and savagery of, uh, of Hamas, Israel never in our 75-year history, did it anything near what they did. I, I want to explain. I, I today spoke to a family, the Zach family. The parents and the younger brother were, were murdered. They were waiting in the shelter, and the, the, the sister, uh, uh, Hadar, was not there. She told me that the, the dad was holding the shelter handle so the terrorists can't come in. What the terrorists did, they burnt the whole house and suffocated... The mom, the dad, and young uh, brother Sagi. His only comfort was they found Sagi and his mom hugged on the bed in the shelter as they were suffocating. Okay, so that was Niftali's response on Pierce Morgan. I'm actually going to play a couple more parts of that interview because it was really good. But again, if you are looking for some good coverage from both sides, I would highly recommend Pierce Morgan's show, Uncensored. And so getting back to the ceasefire... It's to protect innocent civilians. And so the ceasefire is to protect them. And then the challenge with this whole thing is, how do you get Hamas and eradicate Hamas and get them out when, again, the narrative is that Hamas completely has commingled themselves within the civilian population and, you know, you basically can't tell the difference. You don't know who's Hamas, who's an innocent civilian and all that. So it's almost like they're all lumped together. All right. Next up, I'm going to play you a clip from Joe Rogan that a friend of mine sent me. To be honest with you, gosh, this is probably pretty bad. I haven't got a chance to listen to as many podcasts as I normally listen to on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm recording my own podcast, and Joe Rogan's one of them that has just slid down my uh, my priority my priority chain. And God, it's mainly because dudes' podcasts are so long. Oh my God, my last episode I went an hour and five minutes, and I was like, "Holy mackerel, that was long!" And then his are like two to three hours every time. That is that's a lot. So anyway, here's the clip because my friend said, hey, you should listen to this. It's Rogan's take on the mainstream perception and how it's changing during this conflict. So give this a listen. It was always that Israel's the good guys, the Palestinians are the bad people. That's how it was. But the mainstream perception now has very much shifted, don't you think? Like with this 100%. last, when you see like that Iron Dome and you're seeing these rockets being fired out of Palestine and they're all getting detonated in the air. And then you realize like, oh, this is, this is a kind of a crazy situation. Like one side has this insane technology and the other side is kind of in an open air prison camp in a way. Like you can't go anywhere. Right. You're kind of stuck. 25% of American Jews now, after the latest onslaught in Gaza, believe Israel's an apartheid state. And that, that shows you how dramatically the narrative has completely flipped on its head. Because for the last 20 years, Israel's been losing control of dictating the narrative. I mean, that, that was really what they relied on for so long, that we're acting in self-defense, that we're surrounded by people who hate us and hypothetically will commit genocide against us to basically defend the fact that they are committing de facto genocide in Gaza, that is the erasure of, of Gaza residents. It's the erasure of a culture. It's not just the extermination. That, that's according to the UN. But yeah, the, the tide has changed, Joe. They can no longer say that they're acting in self-defense over the last 20 years with the bombardments, with the invasions, with the colonization outside of their borders. I mean, we're talking about Lebanon, Syria, and the Golan Heights, and just constantly bombing 
and open air prison. It is an open air prison. There's two million people trapped there. They cannot leave without permits by the Israeli government or the collaborative government in Egypt. Those people are trapped. All right. Obviously, there is a lot of controversy to this open air prison discussion and all that. You know, I did have a few friends, ironically, send me the Obama speech from 2013. And then I said, dude, I played this like three, four episodes ago. And it made me realize they have not listened to my podcast. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, you didn't listen, did you? And they're like, no. (laughs) Anyway, here is a one minute version of that, which I think brings out the most important parts. And it kind of talks about what the guest on Joe Rogan's show was, was mentioning. But the Palestinian people's right to self-determination, their right to justice must also be recognized and put yourself in their shoes. Look at the world through their eyes. It is not fair that a Palestinian child cannot grow up in a state of their own, living their entire lives with the presence of a foreign army that controls the movements, not just of those young people, but their parents, their grandparents, every single day. It's not just when settler violence against Palestinians goes unpunished. It's not right to prevent Palestinians from farming their lands or restricting a student's ability to move around the West Bank or displace Palestinian families from their homes. Neither occupation nor expulsion is the answer. Palestinians have a right to be a free people in their own land. All right, again, that's the speech from Obama that he delivered in Jerusalem in 2013. You know, I'll I'll find the full speech and I'll put a link in the show notes for that. Okay, next up, I want to play for you this. You know, you might have heard, but a lot of controversy with Dave Chappelle. Dude, that guy does not shy away from controversy. And he definitely, uh, he speaks his mind. He's probably the original call a spade a spade guy. But anyway, he had a situation, I believe it was last Thursday in Boston, where he was giving, I guess, chiming in on this Palestine Israel situation and then some people in the audience got mad and you know it was reported differently or it was reported one way in the Wall Street Journal and then here's the TMZ reporting I guess this person was in the audience so she was there so listen to her take on what took place with Dave Chappelle I saw Dave Chappelle last night at Boston TD uh, Garden. It was sold out, so I would say 22,000 people were there. Three quarters of the way into the show, he said, I want to address what's going on in Palestine and Israel. He specifically said Palestine and said it before Israel. He said what happened on October 7th wasn't right, but also what's going on isn't right and not just. You can't kill innocent civilians like that, and the whole world sits silently and watches. Then someone shouted at him from the crowd, shut the F up, Dave. He then went nuts and yelled back, no, you shut the F up and you don't take tens of billions from my country to go kill innocent women and children and come tell me to shut the F up. He said, don't come begging for money from my country and then go drop bombs on children and cut off innocent people, water and electricity. You have the audacity to pay, come see me and then tell me to shut the F up. No, you shut the F up. The crowd then started clapping and cheering for him and saying, yes, Dave, and chants of free Palestine. And then he said, Said, you're damn right, free Palestine. All right, that's enough on all that for today. Let me talk about a couple other things. Former Vice President Mike Pence dropped out of the race. I think I said this after that first presidential debate. I was like, he's done, dude is cooked. But anyway, this was an interesting article. It says Pence drops out of 2024 race, dozens of supporters left flabbergasted. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. The dozens of supporters part was a joke. He never had a dozen supporters. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was another joke. Anyway, there's that. Matthew Perry from Friends died. That's very sad. May he rest in peace. The only thing that I did want to say about that is I do find it strange when a celebrity dies. And again, rest in peace to him. I do find it strange when just the random people come out of the woodwork on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, they, they post something and, you know, write something that's so heartfelt and they don't even do that. It seems when their own family member passes away, 
I don't know. There's just a weird, there's just a weird relationship with fame and celebrities in this world. So anyway, rest in peace to Matthew Perry. That definitely is sad. All right. It's Monday. We're almost getting to 30 minutes and I'm going to end with this. You know, I had this conversation with two different friends this weekend and, you know, we were talking just about, gosh, the, just the divide and the animosity between people. And this is specifically, you know, in dealing with religion and you know, what I said to both of them was, I go, think about 2020, the first six months, and what happened with masks, and how fast that happened. And what I mean by that is, you know, all of the sudden, groups of people were pitted against each other within what felt like months, I mean, if not weeks for that matter, but super, super fast, over the concept of wearing masks. I mean, you could see videos in grocery stores where people were getting into fights and all that stuff. So that was just masks in the matter of months. Then, you know, masks to me were the setup for the vaccine. And again, whether you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, that's a personal decision. And I respect that, you know, either way. My point is the division that then got caused by people's stances on getting or not getting the vaccine. I mean, that became visceral, like that became visceral. And all of that happened within relative months. Now, let's say let's say a year. I'll give you a year, year and a half by the time the first vaccine came out. I think it came out nine months after COVID. So now, take this to religion and take this to a concept that people basically are born with. You know, if you're, if you're a religious person and you grew up with religion and your parents instilled religion into your, I guess, your life and lifestyle, you know, you basically were born with that. And so in the Israel-Palestine situation, not only are we talking about, you know, to me, it all starts in 1948. So everyone born after 1948 they basically were born to hate, you know, the Palestinians were born to hate the Israelis. And whether you agree or not, and this is probably less, maybe less the case, because I think the Israeli life in Israel is is and has been, you know, better than the Palestinians' lives in Gaza and the West Bank. But even then, I mean, there's so many videos on YouTube that show, you know, Israeli settlers, you know, just treating Palestinians terribly. And again, vice versa, Palestinian people obviously hate the Israelis as well. But my point is, you're talking about 1948, so 70 years of people that were born to hate. And now, if you want to dial that back to the way some people like to dial it back, myself not included, you know, I I just, I can't get into the 3,000 years ago this happened and thinking that the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the trail of facts is clear and unchanged for 3,000 years. That to me is difficult to grasp, but for argument's sake, let's grasp that. Therefore, now you're talking about hate that has been present for 3,000 years, you know, not even 70 years. And again, this is just between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now you can create a separate category for within the Muslim religion, between, you know, the Muslims that are Arab and probably follow the Sunni side of the Muslim religion, and then the Muslims that are Shi'i, which is what Iran is. Sunni is Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan. Actually, I looked it up and 90% of the Muslim religion is Sunni. 
10% is Shi'i. I I actually did not know that. I didn't know it was that slanted towards Sunni. So anyway, these two factions, you know, again, if you want to dial it back thousands of years, these two factions have not gotten along. So anyway, my point of all that was that what's happening right now is something that has been bred into generations. There's generations of hate. I mean, seriously, generational hate. And that is not going to be solved overnight. And so that is why world leaders, you know, world leaders with clout, you know, need to lead right now and, you know, pump the brakes on this. Let's have a ceasefire. Let's bring, bring people to the table and have discussions and see if there, you know, if there can be a plan for this two-party state where Palestinians and Israelis get to live, you know, not really together. I mean, separate, but together. Anyway, that's it for today, everybody. It's Monday. I don't want to get crazy heavy, although we're at 35 minutes. Have a great day. Call a spade a spade, and we'll talk to you soon. This episode was brought to you by Boost Liquid Vitamins. Wake up, take your boost, start your day. Drink your vitamins, build your immune system with Boost. Available on Boost.com.